We now have uh, the fireside chat. Uh, I'd like to request all of you to please invite on stage Pratul Shroff, uh, founder and CEO e-Infochips, and uh, Sompal Chaudhary, partner Bharat uh, Innovation Fund. I'd like to now request uh, Sompal Chaudhary to introduce uh, Pratul Shroff to us. Over to you, so. So, ladies and gentlemen, hope you had a great lunch and enjoyed the morning session. So, today, today for the next 15, 20 minutes, we are going to have a very interesting talk about e-info chips. So, I have out here Mr. Pratul Shroff. He's the CEO and founder of e-info chips. If you guys recall, a few months back, InfoChips got acquired by Arrow Electronics. It was one of the largest acquisitions in the ESDM sector. In fact, almost for all sectors, uh, on the tune of 250 to 300 million dollars. Right? The exact number, as Pratul points out, has not been disclosed. So what we, uh, so Pratul just flew in from Ahmedabad, just for a couple of hours to be with. Uh, and uh, what I plan to do in the next 10, 15 minutes is to just kind of ask Pratul about his experiences, how he got started with InfoChips, and that was, believe me, it was way back in 1994. So this has been almost 24 years in the making with uh, InfoChips. So I'll hand it over to Pratul. Uh, my first question, Pratul, again, thanks a lot for coming here. Uh, I would request Pratul kind of talk a bit about his journey back in the initial days. Uh, he was in Intel, then with Daisy Systems, and then came back to India and started up Info Chips way back in 1994. And of all places, it was not in Bangalore, it was not in Noida, it was not in Hyderabad, not in Pune, this started up in Ahmedabad. So I would like to ask you, Pratul, if you can share your thoughts. What was your journey uh, back in the initial days? How you guys started up InfoChips? Why Ahmedabad? Why suddenly ASIC design back in the early 90s? Your thoughts, please. Now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. So, uh, Madhu, fireside chat, and I was uh, waiting for some fire. Uh, I guess you're going to put me on the fire, so to speak. Uh, so, like you said, I was in USA, and uh, one fine morning I decided that uh, let's go to India. I think uh, each one of us has to found, uh, he has to find his own Mount Everest, right? Something to do, some challenge. Uh, you do one processor, you do one operating system, you do another chip. You do some networking, and then what next? Uh, you go from 16 to 32 to 64 bit processors. Uh, and of course, it's very important. Uh, but where do I go with it? I mean, what's my ambition? What's my dream? What's my life goal? And uh, have you seen the movie Swadesh? Yes, it, absolutely. All it, of us, I think, have seen all it. All of us identify with that, right? So uh, this was way back in 87, even before 94. Uh, movie was not out yet, uh, but I said that we have to go back, people like us, it's difficult. And 87 was time when there were still rotary dial phones. Mm -hmm. I'm an old duffer. So uh, we had Maruti Suzuki, one car, rotary dial phones, no mobile phones, no internet, license raj, everything required a license. Uh, but I took the plunge. And that was a purely an emotive decision. Uh, fundamental drivers were India needs us. Let's go back and do something there. And the dream was that if I can do something in Ahmedabad, which is my hometown where I was born and brought up, that would be great because there is no technology there, right? Uh, so I went, I came back in 87. I started uh, InfoChips in 94. Uh, <clears throat> but when you start a services company, you're not going to get any backing, right? Uh, Daisy went public in USA. I made some money and naively, foolishly, at the age of 27. 
how did you decide it's an ASIC design services or design services company, you're gonna, why not software? Why not something else? Yeah, so actually we started with uh, one contract in Embedded Systems uh, in 95, that was the start. I had one customer and uh, 97 what happened that customer disappeared. They went bankrupt. So then I had to decide what to do in life, right? Uh, I'd done my design on the chips with the schematics and meanwhile, Verilog had come along, and the light bulb that went in, uh, that went in my mind was that Verilog uh, doesn't require semiconductor physics knowledge, right? You don't deal with the transistor level devices. So can I take a bunch of electric, electrical, electronic engineers guys and teach them Verilog? So I hired four engineers uh, who were doing some cellular tower maintenance. Uh, one guy was doing industrial controller design and things like that. And I challenged them that, look, if you do this, your life will be transformed. Literally will be transformed. But you have to be patient. You have to work hard. And most important of all, you have to put the money where the mouth is. So if you truly believe in it, then you have to take a pay cut. Uh, and literally, they took a pay cut of 30%. Uh, we worked together at, on our own for almost a year. And luckily, in 97, uh, the Bay Area was abuzz with the optical networking. Everybody was looking for verification engineers. And we applied, and they got accept, you know, accepted as uh, verification engineers. So I said, aha, maybe this model works. So let me hire 30 more electronic engineers and scale up and expand the model. And, and then we started kind of expanding on that. So that was one. Uh, being Ahmedabadi, always uh, very tight with the money and very careful about the money. So uh, we also, I kind of thought about at that point in Bangalore also. Uh, Bangalore was buzzing even at that time, nowhere near where it is today. But uh, certainly, Ahmedabad had no ecosystem. There were no engineers, there were no customers, uh, there were no university courses, no professors, no nothing, right? Pure vacuum. Uh, and I happened to come across a book called Crossing the Chasm by Geoffrey Moore. And uh, one line stuck with me. It said, uh, early on you have to decide whether you want to be a fish in a huge pond in an ocean, or you want to be a big fish in a small pond. And he very clearly said, you have to be a big fish in a small pond. I said, all right, let me stay with the geo. Let me be a fish. Forget about the big. Let me first be a fish in a pond, very small pond, not even a pond, right? And so the decision on Ahmedabad was based strategically because of that and because of the emotive reasons. And similarly with ASIC, you want to do something which everybody else is not doing. So at that time, in mid-90s, the NASCOM report had come out, what a Y2K and how big those opportunities are going to be. And I kind of scratched my head. Do I want to do this? These billions of dollars makes a lot of sense. It's a grunt work, and you can make a lot of money. But the saying is, when you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you're done design engineering all your life, you're going to be naturally attracted towards that because that's where your passion is. So I said, forget Y2K. This is going to be a rough road, but let's give it a shot. That's how we got started in ASIC. So great. I mean, you, you have went from in the last 34 years, uh, probably from zero to what, 1,500 employees? Yes. 1,500-ish? Correct. And I believe I was chatting over with you over lunch. One third of your work is still kind of typical ASIC design services and the remaining is uh, more systems, right? So can you just help us over the years, you know, how did you guys scale up? I mean, were there any points of pivot? Were there any specific decisions you had to take? It was a, you know, breaking decision you had to take and so forth, right? And how was your journey overall? I mean, was it a, a step jumps during that course or was it a very smooth sailing on the way? Smooth sailing, I'm sure, you know, every entrepreneur knows how smooth sailing the growth of the company always is, right? So it's all uh, blood and sweat and hard work. Uh, there were certain pure points, but early on, the minute you decide you're going to be in Ahmedabad, the minute you decide I'm going to uh, train people, number one is that you're going to invest in people, right? And that's a risky proposition because your assets are walking, everybody says that, Every, you know, the assets walk out the door, walk in the door even more dangerous in Ahmedabad because Gujubais are known for the, their love for the money. 
a uh, little bit of higher pay and they come to the Bangalore or USA or whatever. Uh, but if you, I fundamentally believe that if you are good to the people, people will be good to you. So if you invest in them, they'll, they'll stay with you. And uh, by get, uh, grow, you know, uh, grace of God, that has kind of worked out. Uh, so the way we grew is that we invested a heck of a lot in people in terms of the soft skills, in terms of technology skills and all of that. That's number one. Number two, we kept investing in technology. So first we did the Verilog and kind of got into that. Uh, you might remember, a lot of people might remember a company called Vericity, yeah. uh, which came up around 2001, and they were looking for the consultants uh, to sell their tools, right? Later on, got acquired by Cadence. But I think the pure point was that we decided that we'll uh, train about 30 people in e-language and Specman, mm -hmm. and they were in high demand. So we got a lot of business, and we were able to scale up from there. Uh, second pure point came, uh, similarly, we invested on DaVinci processor in TI. At that point in time, most of the service companies were in love with the home app processors. So Wipro, Haskin, Mistral, everybody was anchored around home app processor. I said, this is, this is a crowded marketplace. We are not going to get in here, right? So we took diametrically opposite approach, and we went with the infrastructure DSP, DaVinci processors. Worked on it, uh, made it a success, and that's where the next uh, phase of the growth came. And about three years ago, we did the same thing with the Qualcomm. When Qualcomm decided to go away from only mobile market to non-mobile market, they would need a design house. So we partnered with them. We were one of the first companies to partner with Qualcomm, actually. Uh, and that's how we got introduced to Arrow, as a matter of fact. So, so I, I mean, again, as you're telling your story, I'm starting to see a pattern, right? Uh, be different, right? Do stupid things. You could do stupid things, but be different. Don't follow the crowd. Yes. Right? And, and during that course, did it ever, I mean, how many times, or maybe if you can just talk about an incident, but you were probably ready to give up. Has that ever been, that kind of an incident? Honestly, with all honesty, no. Uh, so I talk about the five Ps uh, in my mind for building a company, passion. I think passion is the most important driver. I don't think money is the driver, passion is the driver. If you are passionate about it, then you'll do the things because you love it, for the love of it. And this sounds very cliche, a lot of books talk about it, but I truly believe there is a lot of truth in it. People, processes, right? Persistence and patience. So if you kind of sum it up, these are the five, you know, Philip Kotler in marketing talk about five Ps, four Ps, five Ps. My Ps, my, these are my five Ps. People, uh, passion, people, processes, persistence, and patience. So you have to be persistent. And the minute we talked about doing the ASIC design in Ahmedabad, I knew that this was going to be a long haul. It's not going to be easy, right? The minute we got into the hardware design, board design, or the high-speed processors, we knew that this is going to be a long haul. There are going to be a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, you have to keep people motivated. You have to keep coming up with the new stuff. You have to keep people engaged. And all of that becomes very important. So another thing we did, I read a lot of books. I told you about Geoffrey Moore. The other one I came across in early 2000s was uh, Jim Collins, Good to Great. I'm sure yes. most of the people might have read it. And he talked about the vision and the core values. So somewhere in their era, 2003, 2004, we came out with the vision uh, to be an innovative, innovative technology company. Uh, and that means that you'll keep on innovating all the time. Uh, that creates the leaders of tomorrow and distributes the wealth. And I'll come to that part of the vision later on. But along the side, we also define the five core values. All of these sounds very mushy mushy management stuff, right? But I think it's very, very important because the people get aligned. So two of our first two core values, customer first and disciplined execution. So if you are a service company, all customer cares about is quality, time to market, very important. The rest of the things, they don't care. So, so Pratul, shifting gears slightly after 34 years, you decide to get acquired, right? I mean, and maybe, you know, I'm going to ask some very specific questions on this. Uh, based on uh, you can answer or you can skip, right? but I'm probably going to push you a bit into the un uncomfortable zone out here. So, Pratul, I mean, what kind of went on 
Did you get an offer from Arrow? Did you decide that, hey, it's time to, you know, it's a perfect time? Or how, how did this acquisition happen? And this is by far the largest acquisition in India for the ESDM sector, if not, uh, if not others as well. So just your thoughts, whatever you can share with the, with the team out here. So I'll answer first of you two questions, yes and yes. No. Uh, so, uh, 2017, right? Uh, there are a lot of other things that happened between 2003 and 2017. And if there are questions from audience, we can talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, but in 2017, what happened was that uh, for some reason, uh, all along from 2000, uh, 2012 onwards, we always get uh, calls from the private equity guys uh, and from other investors, but mainly financial. Uh, for some reason, uh, my investment banker called up in uh, June of 2017. He said, Prasul, I don't know what's going on, but it seems like uh, you are a hot property in the market. Mm -hmm. I said, why? I said, just in last one month, I got three calls. Okay. Uh, okay. So all of the design services companies, please hear it out. I said uh, two private equity guys and one strategic investor. And I think there is something to it. Otherwise, I've never seen within one month, uh, all of a sudden three people are interested in one single target, right? Um, uh, I said, well, you know, 2015 and 16, we were not doing so hot. So I said, this year I'm going to get the growth back on the track. Uh, and the background to that, Madhu, is that year on year, we've always grown by 20 to 25% while maintaining our margins. And uh, <clears throat> those two years were the tough years for whatever reason, our internal reasons. And the growth was not doing 20, 25%. I said, no, this is the wrong year. I'm not going to do it. Uh, let's wait. But the exit, it was very clear. Either you do IPO or you get acquired. There, there is no other exit, right? And um, if you do the IPO, you're, it's a lifetime job really, unless you plan to pass it on to the next generation, which I had no desire to. Uh, so we kind of mulled around that, and he said, at least talk to these guys, and that's how the you know, investment engagement is a sales guy at the end of the day. So that's how the conversation happened. And uh, we kind of started talking about it, and uh, I got convinced that maybe there is a value here in terms of unlocking the wealth, and I, I think also these are the years when the interest rates are the lowest, right? You can borrow money at 2%, 3%. A lot of acquisitions have happened. Uh, uh, but what became clear is that Infochips had certain things which were pretty unique. Not too many companies had that. Uh, number one, probably its size. Not too big a company, $80 million in revenue. Uh, more importantly, capability of doing FPGA designs or silicon, capability to do the board design, capability to do to all partner all with rounded, all rounded, all rounded, industrial product design, and then the operating system software, bootloaders, these that, uh, uh, UX, UI, and then we had also added the IoT and the cloud to the story for making for a complete solution, right? So you can do the complete device or a product, you can do the IoT gateway, and you can care of the cloud for doing a complete solution. That, I think, made it very attractive to a lot of people. Um, so that dialogue started in June, July. And uh, acquisition time, you have to do the financial due diligence and legal due diligence. You have to make the data room, right? So we built the data room, and we're going on, trying on journey. Meanwhile, uh, because we're working with the Qualcomm, and Qualcomm had got the distributor, Arrow, uh, so we were engaged with Arrow for about a couple of years. And out of nowhere, uh, Arrow also entered the race, saying... This was a four. four this is a fourth Four one. bidders. Okay. This is a fourth guy. This is a fourth guy. And, uh, and they actually came in pretty late. And they came in around uh, last week of September when I was visiting USA. They said, we want to meet you, and we'll fly out and meet you in San Jose. Their chief strategy officer and their chief digital officer all, all those guys came. And uh, we had chat. And my impression till that point in time was that Arrow is a distributor. 
you know, they are a big company, $27 billion in revenue. Uh, but all distributing components, register, capacitors, processors, memories, whatnot. Uh, and that's why the interest was low. But in two hours that we sat, they kind of showed me the entire story how they're transforming the company. And it was very clear to me that here is a strategic fit. Uh, they have every desire and uh, energy to enter services space because they, in the past 10 years, from electronic components, they had gone to selling the IoT platforms, cloud, software products, uh, Microsoft resellers, IBM resellers, and all of that. Uh, so you can build the services business around all of that, right? And if you are able to do a complete product design, then there is also the potential and possibility of doing the sell-through. So if I have a medium-sized company which is doing 20,000 pieces, uh, we can do the, both the design and manufacturing and services and RMA and all of that, right? So it's kind of really strategic at multiple touch points. Uh, so, 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 Pratul, I mean, just to the audience, obviously we have uh, in India 200 plus design houses and so forth, if not more. I, back at analog devices, I used to keep count, but I don't keep a count these days. What would be your advice to these startups, maybe you could easily group them into large, <coughs> medium, uh, small. I mean, obviously they are doing a lot of Me Too stuff right now, many of them. I mean, would you recommend them to kind of build up a few niche areas of expertise or do you want them to be kind of broad based? What would you see, I mean, given that you had four bidders and obviously people are looking at now, it seems, in the Indian market, how do you want them to get prepared for an acquisition of some sort? Any thoughts on that? So I, I think uh, building the value is very, very critical, right? And building the value, financial value. But that financial value comes from delivering the value to the customer at the end of the day. So you have to be very clear that how am I going to deliver value to my customer? You have to be very, very clear, the clarity in your thought process is absolutely clear, right? That's point number one. Point number two, we talked about some differentiators for InfoChips and there are more, um, but how am I going to be different than the Joe Blow down the street, right? That's going to be very, very critical. Uh, big fish in a small pond, I think that's very important as a part of the strategy, and therefore the specialization and being- Pick out, pick out your niches. Pick out and become very, very strong. Another thing I did, I never looked at a competition. And people kind of say, what are you talking about? How can you not look at a competition? But from day one, we had never looked at a competition. It's a, I used to read Bhagavad Gita. I read a lot of stuff. So I used to read Bhagavad Gita and actually kind of look at it, introspect it, look at an operational manual for life. A uh, couple of things always stuck with me. Focus on the efforts, on the action. The results will happen. Right? And, and you need to take a leap of faith for doing that. It's not easy to do without that. It might take 10 years to do that, but that's what it takes. The second thing uh, that stuck with me from Gita, it says that you're your best friend and you're a worst enemy. Um, and then you read HBR articles on Southwest Airlines. They didn't look at the competition. They came out with a completely new innovative model. And so I said, I'm going to keep my nose to the ground. I'm not going to look at Vipro, I'm not going to look at HCL. I'm going to look at the client, I'm going to look at the marketplace. What is the value I'm delivering? How can I do better and better and better, right? Uh, newer technologies, newer technologies, new data. Training, training, training. So keep at it. And I think Jim Collins also talked about that, uh, along with the five core values that I talked about. Uh, that's called the hedgehog concept. You figure out what your strengths are and keep getting better at it and stay focused there. Because if you're doing product engineering, you'll be swayed to do the IT services. People will come and say, hey, do the SAP implementation, there are 200 people. I'm talking about 96, 97, right? right? right. Yeah. Uh, all those distractions will happen, and a lot of people change their courses very quickly. Uh, we did not, we just stayed with the product engineering right from the beginning till the end, and, and it paid back. It paid off in the long term. So the secret is, along with the five piece that I talked about, you have to be passionate, otherwise you're gonna get tired very easily. 
uh, and persistence and patience, all of that, uh, is also the hedgehog concept, uh, big fish in a small pond. Uh, all of these are a part of your strategy, if you will, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, <clears throat> what matters is what you want in life. Are you looking for an egg? Are you after money? Are you after fame? Are you after recognition? That clarity of what, thought. What if we say all of those above? Well, then relentlessly pursue it. You have to pursue it relentlessly, right? Day in and day out, without getting tired. So if money doesn't happen, you can't get tired. You have to keep at it for the next 10 years, 20 years. So I have one last question before I open it up for one or two questions from the audience. So Pratul, what's next for you? Uh, so for next three years, I'm going to be with Arrow Electronics. They are going to roll up the services. Let's see how that plays out. Uh, and there are so many disruptive technologies these days. No matter where you go in here, look. Uh, there are fundamentally disruptive technologies. And when the marketplace is so disruptive, there are going to be so many opportunities, so many fault lines. And every fault sign, I always say to my guys that wherever there is a problem, there is potential find the potential. And the world is a hot mess. Uh, I, I look at the world and I get worried. Uh, I don't know whether the mankind will survive for another 100 years or not. Uh, on my WhatsApp, the saying is that giving is receiving. So that's going to dominate my thought process. Uh, somewhere else I read that uh, universe is a big Xerox machine. Whatever you do, it mimics. Uh, so you look at so many things, you know, recycling plastic, electronic waste, uh, but all of the things I do will probably, in the long term, if I look at the next 20 years, will gear towards uh, sustainability and Got it. doing something to, to make sure that mankind survives. Right. And I would probably also request you to be part of our ISA ecosystem and help the budding. We have a 1,000 plus IoT startups, right? Yeah. And some kind of a mentorship, angel investing, and so forth. We'd love to get your uh, stuff in. Sure, right. we'll talk about that. So uh, uh, I just wanted to open it up for, we probably have time for one question. Uh, anybody? Can I, just can please, I make one please, comment before please, that? Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to mention mm -hmm. through, the, through this acquisition, uh, one of the things early I did on, and that maybe that's something also food for thought for the design services company. We have about 18% of equity distributed among the employees, which I believe is one of the largest. I started a stock option program in Andhra in 94, 95, when I started a company, which was totally unknown. And I always got accused by the people, because you don't want to pay, you chip know, you know, this certificate. Uh, Today, I'm happy to say that there are about eight to 10 people who probably made more than 10 crores in the stock options. There are about uh, 65 people who have made about more than one or two crores. So about 360 crores distributed. And over the years, the dividends I'm not counting. Uh, and I also get another question, wow, you know, 300, 350 million, whatever the number is, right? That's awesome. But there is a reason behind that. And that is, if you look at the financials, they are absolutely sterling. Uh, if you look at our EBITDA number, if you look at net profit number, if you look at the consistency of the earnings year on year on year, right? All of that is also very important. And this is for the de design service guys or product guys, anybody, right? Who is doing a new company. Uh, making sure that you do that consistency year on year for multiple years and uh, no asterisk in the balance sheet. No footnotes. This loan, that loan, whatever, right? Uh, acquisitions, and especially large acquisitions, I think always want to see that transparency and that honesty in our operations. Something which you have done day in and day out in, in purchase. Fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Pratul. We have time for just one question, please. Anybody? Sounds yes, good. So thanks a lot, Pratul. Thanks a lot for just flying in for just one of us to uh, give us your insights. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot.
I'd like to request Sompal Chaudhary to present a small token of our appreciation to Pratul Shroff. I'd like to take this opportunity once again to thank uh, Pratul Shroff, founder and CEO of e-InfoChips.